result uh, of recent activities, I don't think there will be a court case uh, at any point. So they'll probably be continuing in this state. Um, uh, why am I giving this talk? So basically, while I worked there, it was uh, sort of seeing the forest for the trees. And when you're working for a company, you're sort of sort of biased toward being uh, being positive about it. And um, you sort of are encouraged to be more positive about it. And some of the things weren't really apparent to us. Uh, maybe they would have been if we'd been more experienced with this kind of thing in the past, but they didn't seem obvious then. And uh, yeah, and there was also NDAs and stuff, but um, yeah, they, they tend to apply less when the other side has vanished. Uh, so yeah, basically, I still am not going to release any information on confidential customers at any point. Um, and I don't actually have any current confidential information because uh, it's, it doesn't really exist and I don't really have access to the things that do exist. So everything in this speech is actually based on public information that anyone can get um, with a basic level of, of network knowledge and, and basic level of digging. And I've documented how I've gotten all this information just to show that fact. Uh, yeah, and a good deal of this is actually my fault. The, um, the problems uh, are were in some cases technical, but primarily business. And as the only person really involved from start to finish, um, I guess a good deal of the blame is mine for like not correcting these problems preemptively. But uh, yeah, I won't make the same mistakes again. And make different ones. Um, so yeah, so basically the idea was that, um, the motivation for the whole thing was that uh, there was a lack of privacy and, and freedom on the internet and the laws have been getting progressively worse. So um, we wanted to try to fix this problem by creating an offshore data haven that wouldn't have uh, restrictions placed on it. And we had to figure out how to do this practically. Like you can't really create something and say there's absolutely no restrictions because uh, it'll immediately be used for purposes that will cause it to be shut down immediately. So we tried to strike a balance um, between between what we could do commercially, what we could do practically, and what people would actually want to do. Oh, that's that's interesting. Yeah. Uh, Brooklyn the projector. Let me show you how to do this. Ready? No, I'm not breaking. That's how you do it. Ah, that's marginally better. Uh, it's a Mac. I don't use a Mac. <laughs> I use a Mac. Feel free. <laughs> yeah, but I'll just continue the, the stuff during that. Um, basically, uh, we need to figure out what we could practically do as well as what we what people would want to do. And um, it was, uh, yeah, <laughs> interesting. Um, so we, we wanted to try to figure out a, a good balance. And we decided on something that was basically we'd, we'd uh, prohibit uh, very few things. We'd make all these restrictions explicit up front. And as long as we never change those things, I would be OK with having those restrictions up front. I don't really care if an ISP says, we're going to filter your traffic from day one. It's explicit in the contract. And even if they say, we're going to monitor all your traffic and post it to the internet, if they do that from the start and are consistent about it and upfront about it, there's really no problem. Um, it's only that, that people discover these problems after the fact that it's a real, a real problem for people's privacy. Uh, and um, that was a model that we all agreed on. And um, we also had a, uh, the idea of doing the same thing in multiple locations to make it more secure from a being difficult to shut down standpoint. And also uh, having a complete package of services so it would be attractive to all sorts of businesses. Um, oh, wait. You can't do view full screen. One second. Okay, good. Um, so basically, we met in San Francisco. We decided to do all the stuff. And we were in an interesting position that there were these people that had had sea land since 1967, uh, the Bates family. And um, they'd been using it for pirate radio broadcast, or they'd been doing pirate radio broadcasting not from there. They'd been doing other miscellaneous, like marine type projects, fishing, things like that. And they weren't really from an internet background, and we really had no idea who they were when we started doing business with them. But they had this asset that existed, and we sort of had to do business with them. So we, uh, well, I'll just speak if there's no, there's, it's really just slides. Um, 
the um, it was a sort of we didn't have much choice in the matter like who because normally when you're picking a, a startup company you get to pick all the people involved but so we didn't really do that much due diligence on the whole thing and uh, we met with these people decided to go ahead raise some, raise some angel funding back when it was easy and um, went ahead uh, I moved out there I lived there from 2000 until December 2002 and we did the conversion and of the place into a data center uh, we launched with a lot of publicity. Um, we had pretty good plans, like on paper, but they. This was sort of at the beginning of the dot com problem. So we we were doing business with certain dot coms like Winstar that uh, failed to ship circuits in a timely manner. So we had things like an STM one that was on order that was supposed to be ready by June that never actually got delivered after we paid them, and we were stuck running on a uh, 128 kilobit per second VSAT link. The same one they used like during Burning Man for the internet connectivity was about what we had and trying to host a bunch of content off of that. And um, as a result, we, we didn't even have that for like eight months. Uh, so it was kind of tricky getting any of the customers actually set up, but uh, we went ahead and we eventually got um, some network connectivity. And we had so much press inquiry that nobody actually did any other work. Um, so like every day people would fly out on a helicopter and talk to the press for about six or seven hours and then go back somewhere or go to sleep and that was about it. Uh, I was like the only person doing anything other than talking to the press. Uh, uh, so we eventually got four E1s, which is like eight megs, uh, running from London Telehouse to a building on the, the shore that was really tall. And um, we set up some free BSD boxes with 802.11 between these things because uh, somebody else wanted to get some really expensive wireless gear, but the free BSD stuff was already there and worked. And we eventually had high speed connectivity. Um, we tried to get customers, but they all had. I'll go in a second. Let me fuck. Go on. Okay, cool. Keep talking. Okay. So we tried to get customers signed up. We had a huge amount of initial inquiries. We had like two or three thousand people that wanted to sign up right away in Jan in like June 2000. But we didn't have any internet connectivity then. We didn't have any other stuff. So we sort of waited, and a lot of them like sort of vanished over the time. But we signed up initially just a bunch of um, people that were doing uh, various kinds of things like. Uh, there was one stock market information site and there were some insiders that had their boxes and that was about it for a while. And um, yeah, so we didn't really need, oh, okay, so I can just do full. Oh, okay, so it's just, eight, it's an 800 by 600 projector. Oh, okay. I'm just confused then. I have really bad luck with projectors. Yay. Yeah, finally. What? It doesn't blink. I know how I survive. Um, so yeah, it was basically some initial customers. That <laughs> what did it do? <laughs> yes, that's interesting. Um, so, <laughs> so um, we had some initial customers that were kind of boring and, and very small, and we still had a lot of press coming, and we kept talking to the press a lot. And I actually moved out there full time, and um, was doing work while everyone else was talking to the press. Um, Okay. Um, we set up a temporary thing where we had like five little RS uh, relay racks that were set up in one of the empty rooms. And that ended up being where all the machines went. We had all these plans to build out like really nice data center stuff, but we only got about a third of the money we were supposed to get. So they all actually went in the five relay racks. But we were somewhat embarrassed by our five relay racks that were full of like $300 for you machines. So that was the um, demo room, and there was some other secret room somewhere else in the facility that contained all of the machines, which, yeah, never actually existed. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was really interesting whenever the press would come out because there's like a steel plate in the floor covering up the empty area, and there was one piece of like 12 gauge Romex running down to that that powered the facility that had thousands of machines and all the uh, cooling and heating and there's no other ducting down there and nobody ever mentioned it. It's been photographed repeatedly and they like completely didn't care. Um, yeah, and there were actually some like network engineer people that were also press that went out and did the same things and they also didn't comment on this. Uh, so I think people, the, this whole idea, uh, one second. Uh, sure. Um, e 
that didn't happen because there was no data center that was for the non-oxygen atmosphere. Um, yeah, the original plans for the data center were, I mean, it, it's fairly practical to do there because the rooms are sealed anyway. You could just um, remove the oxygen chemically from the air in those rooms, or at least remove the moisture and remove the oxygen as well. But no, um, that was not done because there was no data center. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, I have photos on the CD um, as well as a bunch of other stuff on the CD and on the website that you'll have URLs to that show all the actual equipment and at the like peak of having machines, which is like 20. Um, the critical components were supposed to be tamper resistant and we decided not to spend the uh, money, like the $20,000 back when we did have lots of money to hire the guy to do that project. Um, despite the fact that that was like the key element of the entire security model, uh, yeah. Um, and we also had customers come and they wanted to set up a complete business. They would come to us and they'd say something like, I want to set up a casino on your site. And um, we have to tell them, oh, you must get payment processing. And uh, yeah, cool. Um, they need to get payment processing. And the way you get payment processing is you have to incorporate in another country, um, get a bank uh, to do business with you in that country, and then um, then you're supposed to put your servers in yet another location, uh, despite the fact that you're already a legal corporation and all of your banking happens through another country. So in most cases, they would come to us, they'd say, we want to set up a new business, and we tell them that you have to set up your payment processing somewhere else, and they would then go to the somewhere else, and then get Colo there, and yeah. Um, we also were pretty, that was probably the single biggest problem was a lack of ability for businesses to actually be processing payments. Um, we also were pretty disorganized. Um, I ended up doing all the accounting and billing as well as all the technical stuff, as well as all the sales stuff because uh, people left as well as didn't do anything. Uh, yeah. uh, two of the three founders left for personal reasons like very early on in the project. Um, there's no problem there, but they just left because I think primarily they didn't like living on a tiny platform in we'll see, imagine that. And um, that left me as like the only like technical person on site. And there was Prince Michael who is nominally running the company, but really didn't do anything day to day for a very long time. Uh, he'd like drive around when we went to go pick up cash and things like that, but that was about it. Uh, we also had security and maintenance people who probably did more work than everyone else put together who were just feeling the generator, running the boats and everything else. But over time, they also uh, left. Uh, the company continued to consume money quite, quite prodigiously until like September 2001. Uh, we would get like a wire transfer of a Western Union and pay like $1,000 to get $9,000 every week to make payroll. It was quite fun. Um, and uh, I ended up taking a bunch of credit cards and maxing them out on cash advances to pay people's salaries too, which was also not very fun. Uh, luckily, I had very good credit. Um, few new customers came over time because of the problems in um, getting the payment processing set up was a primary problem and other general problems. Also, the fact that we were like 10 times more expensive than onshore opportunities made it a bit more difficult. Um, I do note the irony of all the technical difficulties with the talk, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, the, uh, so a few new customers came. Uh, well, hopefully if I don't touch any of this stuff, it won't break. Um, yeah, so the rate of incre inquisition in in increased, like we'd sort of, we had these plans of like the whole dot-com explosion growth and then we cut back on that when everyone else collapsed. We were doing a little bit better than people like uh, WorldCom and Enron for a while. And like the summer of 2001, it had actually gotten pretty good because I moved there full time. I worked there without drawing a salary and or with having it not actually paid and doing stuff pretty cheaply but pretty well. Like we had redundant networks because we used FreeBSD boxes for routers and things like that. It worked pretty well. We were getting a reasonable number of customers in over time, like a few a month actually. And so I'd say 2001, we were actually a pretty successful company. I went to HAL 2001 there and spoke about it there and we got like 10 customers in a week so in that that point things were actually going quite well and uh, well quite well in terms of financial stuff but I was still stuck living there all the time and um, it looked like it was actually in like a year or two going to do quite well but um, the problem is we had this original agreement with the Sealand people that we signed with them where we were going to give them a huge amount of money after a year um, we then, when, one of our, when our CEO left, replaced him with Prince Michael, at least on paper, and there was no real rush to renegotiate because um, 
Like they were sort of running the company officially because the son of the prince was the CEO and they said, oh, just give us money later and it's all good. So we sort of believed that and kept operating while making capital improvements to a place that we didn't really own and building up a business there. So yeah, that's, that's the real mistake that I made there and I learned. <laughs> um, so 2001 was pretty good. But then in fall 2001, we, there's an advisor to Prince Michael's father who is a very traditional, very conservative guy who basically didn't like the idea of Havenco, who got involved and he was trying to do Sealand's claims of sovereignty with the ITU. Like we've been trying to get a, um, a top level domain, ISO re registration, all sorts of stuff for a long time. Not very much work had been put into it. And he was a lawyer that had lots of experience in doing this kind of thing and, or so was said, and was trying to do this kind of thing and took over things like trying to create text for the website, for the Sealand site, and sending off letters to people. And um, that's sort of at odds with Havenco. Like if you're going to have a free data haven thing, that doesn't really make the countries that you're trying to get recognition from that happy. Uh, like they would they were worried that it would be a very bad thing on their reputation. Otherwise, of course, nobody would have heard of it and that would be even worse because it would be like the little weird free state project that some, or little weird like imaginary country thing that everyone else does. But um, I don't know, for some reason they thought it was a serious PR liability to do this kind of stuff. So basically what they tried to do was minimize the, the kind of content we would host and the kind of problems we would cause and they viewed us more as a liability than anything else. Of course, we were also a liability that was paying all of the bills for the whole thing and uh, bringing in customers and stuff. And also, he has very interesting technical ideas. Um, we had working redundant network connectivity and we had no money because they owed like $5 million, including lots of money to me. And um, I decided to spend lots of money that we didn't have on replacing the gear that did work instead of buying other gear. So we bought things like a N by 64 wireless bridge. It was like $30,000 to replace the working 802.11 system that was in there that got rid of our, our multipath and has been unreliable for like two years. Uh, but it was a British company, so it was cool. Um, and um, we sort of continued going. We'd have customers come if they were at all um, questionable, like if they weren't the standard gaming co company or anything else. Uh, the, the, there would be either two routes. Either I wouldn't tell anyone else in the company that this customer was signing on what they did. I would just like sign them up and say this is a customer that's like an ISP or something and that would be fine because that's within our AUP. We didn't know what, want to know what your business was. I told customers like don't tell us what you're doing and um, that was good. But occasionally they would go and actually meet the customer and the customer would be somebody doing something that they found offensive and they would say, oh, we must comply with all international practices and customs for all things. And basically we ended up, we, we had more restrictions placed on us than a US ISP. Um, if it was anything that looked offensive, like anyone might have any problems with it, they would try to get rid of the customer. There's one really good example of that which is coming up. Um, so most, we did lots of cool things during this period because nobody else in the company had root on any of the machines except for a couple of other technical people and uh, so I could set up things like a remailer, um, discounted projects for open source, all sorts of cool stuff because they didn't really involve themselves in it. And uh, at that time, every, the Sealand people were just involved in trying to make Sealand work and they weren't trying to do anything with Havenco and it was very, very good. Uh, and then they started saying they were gonna start taxing Sealand hosted companies and that was very interesting. Uh, so, um, yeah, they started messing with the AUP. They never actually updated the AUP, but there was the de facto AUP of like, don't offend anyone. Um, then the whole September 11th thing happened, very convenient timing, and we got to the discussion of Al Qaeda on, we, we were giving an interview, I think, to the BBC, and uh, I gave one interview saying that basically there would be no problems, this is our AUP, nothing else matters. And then they gave an interview saying that yes, we'd certainly turn this over on the sly with the authorities if there was a serious problem with any of our stuff. And I felt uh, very angry and annoyed at that. And luckily there was sort of, the, I, I was able to only convince them that from a commercial standpoint this was a very bad idea. Not that like we had already told our customers the other thing. And that ended up not running. But uh, financial stability was getting really questionable because we were spending even more money and reducing our demand. So if you, if you spend more money and decrease the demand for your product, that's not a good combination. Uh, yes, yes, yes. They were very, very good at trying to simulate a real country there because they acted like politicians. Uh, 
uh, financial stability was, was pretty questionable and we still didn't have an agreement with them and they kept saying, oh, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. And we also had never actually issued stock or any other stuff to the company, which is coming up in a second. Oh uh, yeah, we hadn't issued stock to the investors because our original um, incorporation was Anguilla and we couldn't do banking there for some reason and uh, we decided to reincorporate in Cyprus. And uh, we never really ended up doing, we, we, we legally are incorporated in, in Cyprus, it's what the WHOIS information is, but um, there was an agreement on paper to issue stock to various people that never was actually done and there was various other stuff that was not done. Um, we also had several large DOS attacks and uh, that caused problems as well as equipment problems with the new equipment that didn't have backups. So we were losing like five days of connectivity at a time, which is uh, really, really, really bad for a DSL connection at home. and for an ISP, it's like, or for a colo company, it's like completely unacceptable. Uh, and um, yeah. So uh, when, then our vendor went bankrupt uh, for our, our circuits and we then had a two month outage due to our E1s being through a company that went bankrupt. Uh, they told us, oh, we're bankrupt, so you must buy new ones, but uh, they refused to buy new ones because that would have been cost money, so they got an agreement with them not to turn them off for a while, but then they turned them off when they went bankrupt because they were no longer a company. And so we were stuck on VSAT again for two months with a reasonable number of customers, and I got to play the like customer service game of making the customer sort of happy by not charging them for a little bit, and yeah, it's gonna be ready next week, it's gonna be ready next week. And yeah, it kind of was amusing. Uh, it was also amusing when the press would come out because like my cell phone had a faster internet connection than our main internet connection, so I would browse on my cell phone, yes. Um, so then the, the absolute worst thing happened in uh, September, or something, it was based, I think it was May 2002. Uh, we had a online movie rental business formerly based in Taiwan, so you can probably pretty easily remember who they were, um, that got arrested that then came to us with a lot of cash saying we're going to set up a business and we want to do it completely legally. We want to do basically DVD rental over the internet by digitizing the, the DVDs, storing physical DVDs, and then only renting one at a time. So you're just downloading streaming, and that would, might have been legal under Sealand law because we could have written it. And uh, <laughs> it's certainly not as questionable as like a pure file trading system. And it might have been an interesting experiment. And they had lots of cash, which would have paid off all of the debt for the company and paid all of their expenses like four or five times over. But no, that was not an acceptable business for Sealand to be hosting. And I pretty much decided then that I was going to quit, but I wanted to um, delay that for as long as possible such that our existing customers would have continuity of service and things like that. But um, really, if they were so concerned about their um, legal state, if they, if they thought they couldn't host this thing, did they really believe that the country had any legal existence from day one? Um, it really makes me question it. Uh, so yeah, um, so basically I was going to depart gradually through 2002 and um, they found a local Red Hat sysadmin from a single box colo to start doing stuff, which was an interesting choice. And um, given that all of our boxes are FreeBSD. And I had some other projects that I was doing with Havenco, like I had a 10 uh, kilogram gold backed electronic currency, which was about ready to launch. And uh, no, they were, you're not permitted to do such a thing because it might be used by money launderers at some point. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, in 2002, November, uh, they decided that the, the uh, ticketing system be removed so we wouldn't have a way of tracking queries and that all the billing information was going to go to the girlfriend of the advisor in the UK to do all our billing such that all of the records exist on a Windows 95 PC in the UK. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. This, after like all the customers are like, oh, can we pay in cash? Sure, but we have to keep the records somewhere. And yeah, so I pretty much refused this. I was also not there at the time. I was on like my first vacation in a while. And I had to do all this through email, which I all have saved and it's very interesting. Um, and basically I refused to let the records be placed in the UK. I said, go ahead and do the billing, have this person do the billing if you want, but we have a remote system that can do it on Sealand and it sort of completely violates our entire security model to do this. And I think it's a professional responsibility thing to prevent such things. I did say if they were fully aware of all the problems, I would, be, I would implement it, but not if they were just asking this. Also, the advisor is not actually a formal employee of the company, so it was basically a random guy asking us to put all the records in the UK. Um, so yes. Uh, 
So we had a meeting in late November over this issue, uh, and they wanted to take over Haven Co., it turns out. Apparently they had a meeting like a day before, um, and they decided, they being a few of the people that were involved, one of the investors, that um, basically they didn't want to be, they didn't want me to continue doing their stuff, and they wanted to have the Sealand government run Haven Co. Um, and we worked out an agreement, which was actually a pretty reasonable agreement, um, where shares would actually be issued, and debt would be repaid to all people out of the profits. I would continue giving them, I'd give them all the information to keep running it, I'd help them, whatever else, and I'd resell their stuff even, and which I felt sort of uncertain about, but yeah. So I got this agreement with them, I got my stuff, and I flew away, and um, I, I waited for a couple of days, and within five days, they violated this agreement, which was quite amusing. Um, they basically started, uh, they tried to enforce a non-compete agreement with me, which, interestingly enough, never existed because they never had one. And um, I had some personal servers that were allowed to be remaining there, which would be about like three of the remaining six or seven servers. And they decided to turn them off and take them and use them for stuff. Uh, even though they were mine. So um, there's that. They also owe me $220,000 and shares. So yes. Uh, so that's what I say, but what you can observe is what you can see on the network. Um, so what I say is that they're continuing to sort of limp along with the CLN stuff, but the cool thing about an internet company having this problem is that you can actually see what their infrastructure is very easily. And that's the technically interesting part of this. Um, what you do is uh, you do a, a who is on the uh, company with Ripe. I have all this stuff on the CD, all the M apps and all sorts of other stuff. Uh, you do a who is on them. You find out where the name servers are. Of course, I know where all this stuff is, but I want to make it documented so that an outsider using just basic knowledge of the internet could discover all this. You do a who is, find the subnets, uh, nmap the subnets, uh, telnet to service ports, see the banners, see what servers are up, and see what services are running, and see what company names advertise themselves. Uh, um, and uh, of course, as far as I'm aware, which is pretty reasonable knowledge about this, that no international organization has actually accepted their claims of sovereignty. Uh, perhaps it will change. Uh, but you can easily see now that the website is, is available. The network is reachable sometimes. You can ping it. It has pretty good ping time still over the single E1. and. Um, they answer email. You can see that there's like 5,000 total queries since day one in RT because it has a ticket number system. Of course, if you know that 95% of that is spam on a normal mail account, then yeah. Um, and physically, it's still there. I haven't seen it in a while, but I believe it's still there. I haven't seen any press come out in like a year, but yeah, it's probably still there. And um, there's probably, from the best of my knowledge, a couple of people there because if you look at all the photos, you'll see the same people all the time and you can easily deduce how many people are there. Um, I don't believe there are any new customers um, and there's certainly been no shares issued <laughs> and there's large outstanding liabilities, I'm aware of this, and they still do not have, like I do know people that have asked them for colo to, for certain businesses, I, I can still see that they're still enforcing this like pseudo AUP, which is on the website. Hmm? Only a slash 20. Uh, yeah, it was only a slash 20 because we were ripe. Uh, I'll do questions in like a minute or two. Um, but yeah, uh, it's got two megs of bandwidth, so uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, and the company registration has lapsed, which is another um, very disturbing sign. You can call up the Cypress Register of Companies and, and ask them what the status is of this company registered at this address, and they'll say that they lapsed because they didn't pay. Um, so I would say effectively it's nationalized, and the three remaining customers, uh, uh, I'll give you a pretty good deal in color if you want, but um, <laughs> they're, they're playing an interesting game there. Um, they continue to take money from them, certainly. Uh, and yeah, it can probably operate for a while because knowing the infrastructure, it doesn't really require too much day-to-day -day maintenance. Um, but if you leave FreeBSD pat boxes on the net unpatched for six to eight months, you might start to have problems. Uh, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, all the network infrastructure is FreeBSD. That's been in the press, so yeah. So if anyone has any 4.8 exploits, have fun. Uh, four, rather, 4.6 exploits. Um, uh, so yeah, I don't suspect much change in the legal status because there's no reason to challenge it now. Um, I'm also in the interesting position that if I want to get any money out of it, 
I would have to sue them. I could sue them in the U.S., the U.K., Cyprus, but if I do, or Sealand. But if I do, it will probably resolve the Sealand sovereignty issue, and does mean that there's no money to be extracted from the thing because it will probably resolve negatively. So it's sort of like a catch-22. Um, so yeah, uh, which is why I'm not doing other things. But yeah, so just as a very basic thing right before I start doing questions, um, they have done business with people in the past. This is what you usually find out with when you do due diligence, and we did not. Um, they had a ship registration business going on where they would register ships for people that were pirate radio broadcasters in the UK. And this guy has a website, and he's still really pissed off at them. Um, basically what happened is he tried to do pirate radio broadcasting in New York using a Sealand flag, and then they hung him out to dry, and the Sealand uh, thing came up in a US court and was resolved fairly negatively, and they took the ship and confiscated it, and it was blown up in like Die Hard 2. So it was like, the reverse re re is bought cheap. So yeah, you can see it on TV. And they wanted to do um, a TV broadcast thing to the, U or to the UK, rather, to the Southeast UK, because most of the people in the UK live near London or in the Southeast. And um, they ended up not doing it. I'm not sure why. Maybe they didn't execute. Maybe they were worried about the ITU stuff, but I don't know. Uh, there was also an amateur radio day, which I put a pretty reasonable amount of effort into organizing so that we do uh, like a ham fest from Sealand. And they then canceled that for UK and ITU reasons. Um, there have been various proposals to expand Sealand physically, and they've come and gone. And they kept saying they were going to issue more coins and stamps, but they still haven't. So that shows, uh, yeah. Um, so yes. Um, next, so I'll, I'm doing other stuff that's very interesting, but uh, the, the key lesson from this is that if you're going to put a cocoa facility somewhere, the political and contract stability in that jurisdiction is very important. Um, <laughs> And that technical costs, uh, when, when you're trying to do something that's supposed to be replicated and you end up making one of them, it's just like selling something to the government and you, it's really expensive for that one. And um, customers really want pretty good service. They don't want to have their network be out for two months. Yeah. The funny thing is they actually put up with it, which like so we, we only lost like 25% of the customers for a two month outage. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, 1500 a month. No, they weren't charged. Um, they were charged for, I think, six weeks of the two months. But it was sort of on an individual basis, like how annoying the customer was for asking for a refund, whether they got a refund or not. Like, yeah. Because we also didn't have any money, so we couldn't really give them refunds. So it was the interesting balance. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yes. Uh, so yeah, the whole idea of doing an offshore thing is, I think, still interesting because uh, a lot of other countries are grouping into one big political, they have harmonized regulations in a lot of cases. It's not like they're becoming one state, but they're having the same regulations in every state, which is effectively the same thing. And um, the ultimate lesson here is that if you have a very small number of people involved in a business, um, the, it's very easy to, uh, to violate agreements because, uh, yeah. Um, and very, it's really fun. I never got to interact with the UN or ITU before. And when they say no, they say no in a very nice way. They say, oh, you must ask these other people and we'll do it immediately as soon as these other people say something. And you get cycles and yeah. <laughs> um, and also claiming sovereignty is actually pretty meaningless unless you have, from a practical standpoint, unless you have all the commercial support infrastructure there for it. Um, Technical things, um, it, it wasn't that bad from a technical perspective until it like started getting messed with. Um, Windstar sucks, but they're out of business now, so it doesn't matter. Um, and uh, yeah, customers aren't really that good at picking out what services they're going to buy because uh, when we were on the satellite, we had people come and ask for bandwidth, and they saw the trace routes, and they said, oh, can we use this for fast stuff? And we explained it to them, but they still took it. Um, yeah, so it's really... Kind of, yeah. Also, if you have a startup um, and you max out your credit cards, make sure you get something in writing in the process of maxing them out such that you get the money back or otherwise have a way to do so. Uh, yes. Uh, so, yeah. So I think still the, the, it's a reasonable idea doing an offshore thing. Oh, and, and the press is not really as... Um, the whole idea of having a free press try to verify things, they don't really investigate so much as report on what other people say. A lot of um, the press, well, I, I do like the press, they do things like they read a press release and they reformat it and they release it as a news story. They don't really do any serious in-depth thing, particularly technical. There are a few really good tech reporters that, that do make um, good investigations of stuff, but in general, the quality of tech reporting 
is uh, not as investigation oriented as uh, the quality of like crime reporting or government reporting or anything else. And I think that's a serious problem. I think it's one of the reasons why we have problems like Enron and all these things is that the press isn't fulfilling their role of actively searching for problems in companies as well as with governments. And they also don't have technical knowledge. So I think the best thing we could do would be to educate the press as, in their role as, uh, as sort of like watchdogs for this stuff on how to investigate technically. I'll do questions in a minute. Uh, so what next? Um, secure client systems I think are important and um, I think secure protocols are important and I, I have uh, a new company doing basically what HavenGo does but in a slightly different way. I have um, cages and racks in various cable head-end facilities around the world and I'm doing tamper resistant hardware in these facilities so that you can basically put a secure server in any country you want as opposed to picking a single country and then you have to comply with the local regulations there but if you pick the right country, you've got a pretty good deal. And um, it's different than Haven Co., but in some ways better, in some ways worse. Uh, pretty much just going to roll through these. Uh, secure clients are very important. Hardware to security is very important. And co-location is also important. Uh, doo -doo -doo, I think, yeah, I'm going to do questions in a second. Yeah. Uh, cool. Um, also, I trust crypto a lot more than I trust people. Uh, but cool. Oh, yeah, the other stuff. Uh, two slides that are important. Um, there's other interesting stuff. Like, the problem with the thing I'm doing now is that it will never accomplish the goal of having a good example of a free state. And that's something that was one of the main goals of Havenco, was to create a, a state which had certain regulations and show that these regulations were self-consistent and that everyone liked um, doing things there if it was successful, then maybe other countries would try to copy it. Because it's pretty useless to us if you had, everyone in the world had to live in a tiny little platform in the North Sea. What we really want to do is change the laws in major countries to at least be more free with respect to information and possibly with respect to drugs and everything else that were, that were serious problems elsewhere. And uh, that's not going to happen when you just put colo in other people's cable head ends. But there are other projects doing it. Um, there's uh, crypto, maybe, I think crypto and technical means are what's going to provide us with privacy and anonymity on the internet. Uh, but it's going to be things like the Free State Project that are going to provide a, a good place to live. It's going to be political change in major countries uh, through maybe acting at a local level and making local regulations. I think the, the drug thing is a good example of that. There are states that are refusing to enforce uh, drug laws and maybe that will eventually put pressure on the federal government. But it's a lot easier to have serious political influence in a local area than in a major area, which is what the Free State thing is doing. Um, they're basically trying to take a state and change the state legislature in that particular state. And it's really easy to do in a small state. Like if you take like New Hampshire, you can get, uh, you can, each district for a congressman for the, the, the local state government there is like 7,000 people. So if everyone at DEF CON moved to New Hampshire, they could elect probably 20 or 30 of the 400 members of the state government in, or the state legislature in New Hampshire. And that's, that's pretty powerful. If you control a state, that's, pr that's pretty important. If you look at like Nevada versus California, you've got a uh, pretty big difference. So, and uh, I have some resources and then I'll do Q&A. Um, I'm writing a book about the Haven Co. experience. Uh, I have a chapter or so ready. I'm talking to a couple publishers. Um, should be ready in a while. Um, the URL's there. There's nothing as much there. I'm going to put up a 10-page thing when I get my 1XRTT working faster in a few minutes. And I'm working on another book on how to be anonymous through technical means on the internet. I have a couple of mailing lists to discuss the stuff, and that's about it. But I'll do Q&A now for uh, the remaining 10 minutes or so. The question is, have I looked at the other technical ways of establishing extraterritorial hosting facilities? Uh, it was always something that was interesting. Um, I've looked at cheap access to space through things like uh, Canon Space Launch Systems and all these things. Extraterritoriality is different than sovereignty. You can do um, certain things if you have a location that's sovereign that you can't do otherwise. I think purely technical internet means, are like 
tamper resistant servers in various places and P2P systems will probably do most of what pure extraterritorial systems will do with the exception of maybe it'll be a cost difference. But a factor of 10 or 1,000 cost difference is a huge factor. So those systems are interesting. I think space like low Earth orbit is one of the most interesting because you have communications and then hosting in the same place. Uh, so yeah, that's, is that sufficient? Okay. Uh, I'm just going to go from that side to that side. You? Sure. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go into why the bank rigmarole was a serious problem. Uh, basically, every business we had hosted with us wanted to be a um, some sort of business that would make money. And if you want to make money, you have to collect money from somebody. And um, you can't really process credit cards. You can't really take wire transfers unless you have a bank account. Now, there are no good internet-only payment systems that are that allow everyone to work without um, requiring incorporation or jurisdiction in some location. So it was impossible for a business to work with that system. That's one of the things I'm working on still. Uh, that's why I was going to run an online currency. Sure. Um, yeah. So one of the things that we started with with Havenco was actually we were going to run an electronic cash system from day one, but we refused. There was another person that was going to develop it for I think 30k, and we refused to spend out of our millions of dollars the 30k on that. So that didn't happen. And then I had a system that was developed for summer of 2002, which they refused to deploy. So it was a political problem. There are different l risks if you're trying to run a payment system than if you're trying to be a colo company. If you're trying to be a colo company, your customers might do bad stuff. But if you're trying to run a payment system, you have to comply with financial regulations. Right. But at the simplest level, somebody's yeah. Clearing. Every company that does clearing um, on the internet for people requires that you be incorporated either in their jurisdiction or in a major jurisdiction. There is no way a CLN company could get business service with any of those companies, which is really like a catch-22 and made it very unsuitable. Um, for a couple of minutes, uh, if anyone wants to, feel free. But I thought about it, and I thought, hmm, if I do this, then I'll be stuck here. What am I going to do? And. Um, it doesn't really seem like it's worth the effort to do it. I, it, would, it would, you could do it for like 20k or less. You rent a helicopter, it'd be done in like 10 minutes. But uh, yeah, <laughs> it's not really worth it. You can sell it on eBay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, perhaps. Yeah, if anyone wants information on this, feel free to email me. <laughs> Uh, did I have any fear that someone would pull a rainbow warrior on it? I had more fear, actually, that the concrete was falling from age and was going to actually fall apart when the rebar rusted as it was, than that someone would actually do anything. I don't think anyone actually cared about it that much to destroy it. Um, our customers were completely inoffensive. They were like web hosting and uh, there, there, no, there were like casinos, which exist everywhere. There was a uh, or you can, you can actually, 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 I can talk about any customer that service banner appears. There's an organ auction site that has transacted exactly zero organs. There is a casino. There's an online stock market that only trades that single casino. And um, yeah. And there's a, what else is there? There's a web hosting company which has a banner that's available. And there's um, that might be it actually. But there's like no more than two or three more. Uh, you. I, I did have a lot of customer inquiries that surprised me. Um, they were mainly people that wanted it, the businesses that didn't need our services at all, really, that wanted to buy our customers. A lot of our customers that remained the longest were the ones that needed our services the least. They were running businesses that could be hosted anywhere, and they just wanted it for novelty value because they had too much money, um, and or they liked the project or whatever else. So that was what surprised me the most. It wasn't really that people were running really innovative things, because all the, the problem is our service was expensive enough, and we didn't have all the pieces in place for payment processing to make it impossible for a little interesting project to happen. There were people that came to me with ideas for things, and I was able to get them like discounted hosting until a certain point when the people decided they wouldn't allow that kind of thing to happen. And I didn't have enough money to pay for these services on, for them myself, because Havenco had all my money. So 
unfortunately, interesting stuff hasn't happened. But yeah, definitely, I think the really interesting services are the ones that are the that have the least capitalization, especially now, and those are the ones that I think are most interesting for hosting in the future. Um, yeah, they were aimed at specific customers, and I think they were misdirected because the last two octets were misplaced of a major other server. But yeah, it was kind of silly. Also, some customer servers installed Red Hat um, six, you know, Red Hat four two, or no, Red Hat some old version of Red Hat that wasn't patched, and they got rooted within like three minutes, and that was a cause of problems. But I should like spread out on the other side. If, uh, anyone over here that wants? Sure. Um, tamper resistant hardware and its application. Basically, I'm using IBM 4758s, which I bought a bunch of really, really cheap because some other dot com bought a bunch of them and they're like 100 bucks now. Um, also, FreeBSD boxes with encrypted disks and otherwise uh, designed so that if you power them off, they don't have any state involved that's unencrypted. Um, that level of security combined with the physically secure facility of like regular commercial standards, like you put r racks in a major colo, is pretty good. It means that if somebody comes in and tries to extract the equipment, they'll turn the equipment off or they otherwise will not be able to get the sensitive data on the machine. They can do a DOS attack in your machine effectively by turning it off, but that's about it. So it really reduces your need for uh, worrying about security on the physical side quite a bit, which is really an important thing. It's why we originally planned to do it with Avenco, but uh, no, uh, we, we actually my personal servers had that, but nobody else's servers did. Um, what else? Sure. Feel free to this one for reasons, open DBS? Okay, OpenDBS, the electronic cache system that was going to be deployed with uh, 10 kilos of gold, um, exists as software. Does not exist as deployed system. Will exist as soon as I have enough colo facilities up to host it reliably. Um, and when I move to a place where I want to be in a couple of months outside of the US. Uh, so I hopefully will have a working test jail electronic cache system for customers. But really there's like a catch-22 in deploying a system like that. You have to have customers that you can convert all at once to it to make it a worthwhile system. And if you run a colo that has payment processing for customers, it's easy to do that. But I'm building up customers again to do the same thing. But Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I just want to, for selfish reasons, want to deploy the service as a service first, as well as release the code on the same date, such that I can actually make money off of it. Because if I release the code now, I don't really have any advantage in running it. But I will release all the code under like an LGPL or a GPL as soon as the system is ready to be tested. Um. Uh, eGold is an unrelated system. Um, I do know the people that run eGold and they run a system that doesn't use the same technology. They're not as worried about individual user anonymity. They're worried primarily about being a reliable long-term system. They've been in operation since like 96 or 99 or something and they're, they're pretty good at that. But they're located in the US and they keep all the records in the US and are they're not worried. They, don't, they have actually gone out and said that they will turn over information on subpoenas because they have to without difficulty. My system, I will only feel comfortable, I will not deploy any system that's not fully anonymous to the best of my ability because I think to do otherwise is irresponsible. Uh, anyone else? Uh, cool. I do. Uh, actually, I will take it out. But anyone else have questions while I'm doing that? Go ahead. How much? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Um, <laughs> we, we could actually. <laughs> yeah. Did uh, you two have, in fact, the, the contract? Uh, if they minted Sealand dollars, they'd probably be pegged to the U.S. dollar, but uh, they haven't gotten around to doing that. So. This is the only Sealand passport I have ever seen. Actually, one of the security guys had one because he'd been there for like 20 years. Um, you can see the lovely handwritten numbers in the front. Uh, yeah. So this cost me $220,000 in three years of my life. <laughs> yes. 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 Joy. 
It doesn't have that many pages, though, so like it might last for like one session, but that's about it. <laughs> um, any other questions? I have not attempted to use it because um, I sort of value my ability to travel unmolested, and um, I don't like the TSA or customs or immigration all that much, and I think I'd be stuck doing it. It's also, it would be a felony for me to use a Sealand passport entering the U.S. because I do have a U.S. passport, so I can only use it going into another country. And I haven't really wanted to do that. I might try it. If anyone knows any government officials in another country, I'd be happy to try it. But. Oh, sure. I think oh, my, I'll just go into my plans for Metacolor. Basically, what I'm doing is this, this co pure color thing, which will make money. And then I'm going also to a couple of countries around the world that have big free trade zones and setting up an internet zone within the free trade zone so that you can have maybe a couple hundred acres of space, because some of these are pretty big. They're on like uninhabited or undeveloped areas. And set up uh, reverse engineering labs, set up office space, set up anything you want in these facilities that will have high speed internet. I have three OC192s to one of them, and it's really cheap. So you can do all sorts of interesting stuff um, from interesting places. And I think once I have a couple of those up, then I can go to other countries that are bigger and more respectable and say, we have all this existing uh, free trade stuff that will all move to your new place if you'll set up a certain set of laws and a certain compact that will not be violated by your country at any point. Um, my experience dealing with countries is that they tend to try to violate stuff anyway, but um, there are these things called guns, and I would make sure that there was something stronger than the Second Amendment that uh, made sure that the free trade zone wouldn't be um, at risk. So if anyone has any, like, uh, maybe, like, division-level TOE that they want to sell really cheap someday in, like, 20 years, come by. Um, a lot of the places that have big free trade zones, there are usually, a lot of them are actually in unfavorable big countries for freedom, but they have small parts that are free, that are free. Like China has some autonomous free trade zones that are pretty free internally. And I would be happy to set up something where it didn't transact with a local country. There are a lot of places in the Caribbean that are getting fiber now that are great for this kind of thing. Places in Central and South America. Yeah, I mean, there's a place that I have fiber to. Um, that somebody else rather has fiber too that I can get at a really good deal and have as much space as I want. And thanks to the wonders of DWDM, 10 pairs of fiber is an awful lot of fiber now. And it goes to a major nap in the US and to Europe. So I can sell color really, really cheap if you get a Metacolo. Um, I would push, I would, I would do it again if and only if we could push for a legal test case immediately. I'd put in like a month of legal test case where I'd put the most, uh, the best possible um, test case on there. I don't know what that would be. Maybe that would be downloading a Metallica track or something off of our server um, and try to get it through the courts as quickly as possible because I wouldn't be willing to invest more than a couple months in the whole process. And that was something we had always discussed as the first thing we were going to do but we wanted to be an external customer bringing it in. We had a Church of Scientology hosting customer that would have been ideal, but um, they were nixed by our esteemed advisor. So um, yeah, I tried to host them covertly, but uh, they eventually found the machine that it was hosted on. Can you tell us more about the advisor? Um, he's very old. Um, he never appears in any of the photos because he's very concerned about his privacy. And as much as he has screwed over me and the investors in Havenco, I sort of feel that it would be inappropriate to reveal his identity. Um, however, he would be very easy to find if he started poking around in any of the legal documents related to the circuits that we have, which would be very easy to do. Um, so if, you, if somebody wants to find him, um, I can probably serve as an oracle with one bit of information, yes or no. And uh, so, so feel, free, feel free to try to find this person. Uh, anyone else? Okay, sure. Uh, is there a market for this kind of service? I think there's only a market for this service if you can provide integrated payment processing, incorporation, uh, messaging. And all. You have to be a full service provider. There's a huge market if you can be a full service provider, not just offering a little bit of the whole solution. But if you offer the whole solution to allow a business, anyone here, to create a service that is currently illegal or highly regulated in a jurisdiction, take it, move it offshore, set it up completely with no difficulty, 
then there's no problem getting customers. I think you would have thousands, tens of thousands of customers, um, especially if your pricing was variable with no real mi fixed minimum for the cost. Um, I have equipment in place now. Um, I expect over the next year to get up to full operation, but I can sell Colo in like 10 different countries right now. Payment processing I can do through other people now-ish, and I hope to have the other stuff up in a few months. Uh, it's really uh, a question of what kind of business has come. Casinos I can trivially do now, but things like um, a, a really powerful peer-to-peer -peer system would be difficult to host and would take like six months of development time to put together hosting for. Sure, I think uh, open source and free hosting is very important because I think every ISP really, like people used to give money, like 10% of the money to the church, and they would do good things for people. But in the case of internet companies, the church isn't really helping us in any case. And I don't think any of us are particularly religious or not very many. But if we donate a small amount of our resources, particularly if it's in-kind resources, our professional services, to worthy causes like free and open source projects, legal defense organizations like the EFF, that really is is what we should be doing. And I think people should maybe donate 10% of their revenue to um, free and open source development because they build businesses based on these these things and they, they need to, to make sure that people continue doing this stuff. Uh, if, if every company in the world put 10% of their resources into creating free infrastructure, well, Microsoft probably wouldn't want to do this, but if everyone else did, um, free and open source software, there would be so much great free software out there. There would be, it would be great. Uh, we're getting sort of, well, I guess there's nobody coming after, so any other questions? What pieces are you missing? What else would you like to have? Um, the main things, so for the physical facilities, I have local partners in each of the locations I'm setting up. I'm basically setting up a standard package of admin tools for each package. I have two routers, two terminal servers minimum. So basically it's a twenty or $30,000 build out per, per site, per country. So the ideal thing would be partners in interesting countries or interesting locations that have political connections or business connections that want to be partners in a local venture for this kind of thing. If they're, uh, if they're technical or not technical, as long as they're pretty familiar with local business or otherwise willing to operate. Um, from a payment processing side, if everyone, the other thing that I would like to see is uh, if companies would start to make their services usable without providing huge amounts of identity. We have a huge problem now that everyone requires huge amounts of identity, leaves a huge paper trail when they don't really need it. Um, if you're creating a service, you should take exactly the minimum amount of information from your customers that's required. You shouldn't keep, you shouldn't require that somebody be incorporated in your local jurisdiction to do business with them at all. You should perhaps not extend credit to them, which is a very reasonable thing. But if you just create your service to work with anonymity or pseudonymity as a default service, it'll make everyone, it'll make everything much easier for everyone. It'll prevent the possibility of you being subpoenaed for records. It, well, you might be, but you won't have any records to give them. It'll make everything cheaper for everyone. So I'd like to see a fundamental shift in the way everyone architects systems to be based on um, pseudonyms and anonymity rather than trying to be based on long-term big certification and things. But that's a pretty pretty big thing to ask. Um, and payment processing infrastructure, if there was any good solution for banking in around the world uh, that didn't require people to be incorporated or located in a certain, in a certain place, that would be a, a tremendous help for everyone. Um, I'd like to make money, but I'd primarily like to change the political uh, situation in major countries as well as create a free place for doing this kind of business where people can do this thing. Um, and uh, I don't know, anyone knows any good publishing houses or, uh, or agents? I'd be happy to talk to them too. Uh, uh, anyone else? Um, yeah, I think spam is a very interesting question because we have, um, in, the, in the process of fighting spam, we've actually done a lot of the things that the government would, if, if it were any reason other than fighting spam and you started saying, oh, you can't run an anonymous server, you can't run an open relay, if it was anything but spam, everyone in this room would be, would be yelling that the government shouldn't be doing this. But because it's spam, it's for some reason um, okay to enforce this restriction on everyone. I dislike spam a lot. Spam is really annoying, but I think the way to solve spam is to put filters in your clients and otherwise architect systems so that 
resources that are used are paid for as the resources are used. Um, we shouldn't be trying to enforce uh, identity to prevent this kind of thing and catch people after the fact. It's, it's, a, it's not effective, for one, and it's not, uh, it creates lots of other problems. Um, I'd love, if, if, if I could trade my all, getting huge amounts of spam in my mailbox to have freedom, uh, I'd totally do that with no, no problem whatsoever. Um, from a commercial standpoint, it's tricky for ISPs to host spam without difficulty. Um, what I'd prefer would be a, a system where you didn't restrict uh, what people did saying you can't do spam, but you restrict what, what the, the characteristics of the traffic are. Like you can't send out huge amounts of volume on SMTP on certain times, but or you have to sign another contract. As long, the other thing is if people want to sign up with an ISP that prohibits spam, as long as the ISP says we prohibit spam and under these conditions up front, that's much more acceptable to me than if somebody has, like I know somebody who has a T1 to his house that uh, a major, he actually started the provider and um, then it got bought by another provider and another provider and they started saying he can't run an open relay after, which wasn't used for spam, like for, for a long time. He'd been running this thing quite successfully. So uh, he ended up going with another company in the Bay Area that didn't have these restrictions. But it's fundamentally, I think, contract should be how you specify what you're allowed to do. And if you say something, you should stick to it. You shouldn't change it without notifying the other party and giving them a chance to break the contract. Uh, any other? One more question. Sure. Any, one more question. Who has the last question? Uh, sure. Uh, the VAT group, you mean? Yeah, um, I'm actually working on an unrelated to computer security hardware tamper resistance project, um, which is something that I'd like to talk to those people about. They So the cool thing about tamper resistance, um, as it's used now, is uh, there's a lab at Los Alamos that has broken like they, they, they publish the mean, median, and minimum and maximum stats for breaking certain tamper resistant, so cargo container seals, they've published the stats for breaking them. It takes them a three second minimum to break a cargo container seal, which is protecting us from whatever horrors come from tampering with cargo. Um, it takes them a maximum, I think, four minutes to break, or two hours to break one, a median of 90 seconds, and an average of like 30 seconds, like a mean of 30 seconds, to break these things that are guarding like hundreds of thousands of dollars worth, of, or millions of dollars worth of stuff getting in through customs. And they're like the most experienced group in the world for breaking um, hardware tamper resistance. And uh, I'm working on a completely unrelated to computer security project, which involves tamper resistance, which will be very interesting and hopefully will last for a lot longer than two hours. Um, and that's something that uh, I, will, I will distribute freely for all but one application and charge one application for. And it's an application that no one in this room likes at all or all against, but I'll make money off of it and then use the, the money from that to, to make the system for other applications. Um, but I can't really talk about it right now because I have a patent application sort of in the process of that. But yeah, they're a pretty cool group. They, they if you have a tamper resistant thing, are the people to go to to break it. But cool, I guess that's it. Uh, but uh, if anyone has any questions at any point, feel free to email me. I answer email very quickly, uh, ryan at medico.com.